The peace of the Lord be with you. And good morning and welcome to everyone. Uh, you have the, uh, the, the distinct honor of being the recorded service this week. I messed up the recording at first service, and so you get to be the voices recorded for the, the service this week. So, um, yeah. But other than that, uh, we, do, we do have a, a, well, really just one announcement. Next week is, um, is the, the narrative service, you know, the service in which we will be um, explaining the, the parts of the liturgy, why we do the liturgy as we have it, and, and that sort of thing. Um, Dr. Corzine will be helping me with the, the, he'll be doing the liturgy, I'll be doing the narration, uh, we, so we appreciate his help. But I uh, invite you all to make sure you join us for that, and um, uh, in, invite people to e- either come in person as they feel comfortable, or uh, tune in as we, as we put, the, um, put the video out there. Uh, you know, I always think that, that you hear people visiting church and saying, oh gosh, the liturgy is so complicated, I don't understand what's going on. That sort of thing. I always think the narration is very helpful so that people can know why we do what we do. Again, good for us who, all the more who hear it week in and week out and uh, think about how it exalts Christ and his promises to, to come to us in, in the preaching of his word and uh, in the giving of his body and blood and the Lord's suffering. So, um, yeah, other than that, we'll be following divine service or uh, setting three in the order that's printed in the bulletin. And uh, today is All Saints Day, so we'll be observing that, that feast of all saints. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn 559, Oh How Great Is Your Compassion. You can find that on page 3 of the bulletin, and we will sing it after the pealing of the bells.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart. We confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant to the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgments written. This is honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, 
You knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one holy communion. The mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that together with them we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading for this, the Feast of All Saints, is from the seventh chapter of the Revelation to St. John. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from John's first letter, the third chapter. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord's words in the Holy Gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. 
The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, for his kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we meditate on the Gospel lesson that was previously read. Especially these words. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, as I said before the service, today is the Feast of All Saints, and in this feast we look at the saints. As I say that, I think you all know, but as much as we associate that word saint with the exemplary people throughout the history of the church, in particular, and we think of somebody like St. Paul the Apostle, or St. Peter the Disciple, or St. John the Evangelist, that word saint itself doesn't mean only those people in particular. It doesn't just mean the, the holiest of the holy people, right? Now look at Paul's letters and you can see this. He writes to the saints in a particular place, to the saints in Ephesus. Or as he writes to the church, he kind of describes this, you know, to the church of God that is in Corinth. He goes on from there. This is because the saints are God's people in general. They are God's people who have been made holy. You know, they've been washed from their sin. They've been sanctified, or as I call it with our confirmation students, they've been holified by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, that blood received by faith. I said Paul goes on in that introduction to the Corinthians. He goes on, he says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all of those in every place who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ both their Lord and ours. So saints are those who are holy in Christ. That means as we celebrate this day, we we celebrate those who are saints, those who are holy in Christ. Today, in fact, we remember in particular those who have gone before us in the faith, those who now enjoy the fullness of that holiness with our Lord Jesus. But having said that, as I often do on this, on this day, um, rather than focusing on those who are dead, today I'm going to look at the church altogether. In fact, I want to talk about something that especially marks the church. That's mercy. Now, to be clear, as I say that mercy marks the church, we have to understand something. As, as Lutherans, we use the term marks of the church with a, a specific understanding. We use it to say Um, You know, if you want to know where the church can be found, you look for its marks. As I speak of mercy as marking the church, I'm deviating from that a little bit. How so? Well, ordinarily, what do we as Lutherans say marks the church? If you know that, do you know what those marks would be? You know, what, what would you look for if you were to look for the church properly? You know, if you were to look for where you could find God's holy people, what would you look for? or to maybe make this more concrete, let's say you moved and you were looking for a new church home. What would you look for? Well, I'm assuming most of you would probably get out your phone and you'd look up the nearest Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, right? That's a good place to start, but not just because we're Lutherans and we always want to be Lutherans and those other people are just bad because they're not Lutherans, right? Why is that a good place to start? Well, on the one hand, it's because the expectation should be that as you go to a Missouri Synod Lutheran church, you hear the Bible taught properly, right? But as we say that, I mean, there are some non-Lutheran churches that have some pretty good Bible teaching, right? 
And on top of that, you get some guys out there preaching that are really good public speakers. I mean, you have pastors that can engage people for a half-hour sermon, and the people don't even realize it's that long, right? But is engaging preaching a mark of the church? It's actually not. You know, the reason we should go to a Missouri Synod church is because of the marks of the church, properly speaking. And those are the gospel purely preached and the sacraments rightly administered according to Christ's command, according to Christ's institution. That's what we say as Lutherans. That's, you know, what we say is that you want to know with certainty where the church is. You know, you want to have no doubt where God is gathering his holy people and making them holy then find where that gospel is purely preached. Find where the pastor is telling you that you go to heaven not because you're good enough, not because you deserve it, not because of any merit or worthiness in you, but because of what Jesus has done for you and that alone. In other words, a church where you hear that you are saved by grace through faith alone. Grace alone, faith alone, in the work of Christ alone. Likewise, find where they tell you that your baptism actually buried you into the death of Jesus. Where it raised you in His resurrection. Not because of the certainty of your confession and your words and your faith, but because of the promise of God's Word. Finally, where they tell you that Jesus' body and blood comes to you in, with, and under the bread and wine, delivering to you exactly what He says, the forgiveness of your sins. That's where you find the church. These properly mark the church. Why? Because the church is made holy by these things. Because the Holy Spirit promises to give faith in the Gospel, in baptism, in the Lord's Supper. And that promise is nowhere else to be found. Now, as I've said all that, I'm not going to focus on those marks today. As I say that, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you did just focus on them. And I did that because I am going to tie back to them. But I'm going to do that in view of the mark that I'm talking about. And that's mercy. Those words, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy, tells us that mercy marks us as Christians. Now, to be fair, as as I say that, all of these beatitudes, as we call these blessings that Jesus speaks in the, in the Gospel lesson, all these, these beatitudes, all these blessings do describe the church. But I'm going to focus on mercy for two reasons. The first is because in our society, we need mercy. You know, the reality is we always need mercy in ourselves, but in our, in our society, we need mercy as we interact with each other, maybe more than ever. We're increasingly lacking in it, and we need it. The second reason is because Next weekend is, like I mentioned beforehand, the, the narrative service. And when we do the narrative service, I don't get a chance to preach on, on the gospel there. And next, next week's gospel lesson is the parable of the unforgiving servant. And if you remember that, that's the story of the man who has this debt before his master. And I mean, it's a huge debt, right? It's a debt that's about 200,000 years worth of labor, according to, at least according to the ESV note. The parable starts with this master collecting these debts and he gets to that servant who has this this huge debt and he calls for that to be repaid. And what's the servant do? He falls down before the master and he pleads for mercy. He says, have patience with me and I will repay you. And what's the master do? Does he arrange a, a, a repayment plan? No. He forgives the servant of the debt. He doesn't say, okay, you know, if you work this much overtime and you do this many hours of good work for me, you know, that'll count double and and then this, this debt will be paid up. The debt is forgiven. It's gone without anything having been done by the man. So we're talking about mercy. I bring this in because I won't get to talk about it next week, that is an abundance of mercy on the part of the Master. Right? That man doesn't deserve it. That man hasn't earned it. But out of the compassionate heart of that Master comes this willingness not 
patiently to receive repayment, but to forgive the debt altogether. Now, of course, as I say that, I'm sure that most of you remember what happens next, right? That the, that man then, who's been forgiven this debt, leaves the presence of his master, and he goes out and he finds a fellow servant who owes him a much smaller debt, something akin to a hundred days' labor. And he demands that debt from this fellow. In fact, not only does he demand it, but he demands it harshly. He starts strangling the guy and he throws him into prison. Now, the fellow in that pleads with the man in the same way that the man had pleaded with his master, but the man won't relent. Right? Well, finally, the master finds out and he casts the first man into prison. And to this, Jesus says, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. In other words, those who, of you who do not show mercy, to you mercy will not be shown. Or in the positive, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So we see it then, that mercy is a mark of the Christian. Are you then merciful? Be merciful. Be gracious to those around you. Be gracious to those who sin against you. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard when someone hurts us to be merciful to them. That, that hurt, it, it taints us, it, it pains us, it, it affects our consciences. It affects, even in a sense, how we, we understand ourselves to be able to stand in God's presence. I was reading a book this week that was really interesting in what it said about this. It said that, that when, we are, when we are wounded by hurt, that, that it actually affects us in a, in a way that we maybe don't even understand. And, and he made the point, and the author made the point, that in our society, we've kind of done a little bit of wrong as we've, we've thought about how to, how to handle that. What we've done is that we've taken wounding as an opportunity to, to love ourselves and build ourselves up. You know, in other words, what we've done is to take that opportunity to, to love ourselves and say, you know, I was hurt, and now, now that justifies however I want to act in the same way toward others. He said we, we use this hurt as a, a justification for the self-centeredness that we all actually already have as sinners. But that doesn't do any good, does it? Instead, what it does is it envelops us in that self-centeredness. It turns us back into ourselves, into to navel-gazing, as I periodically talk about it. Christians, our default, instead of that, should be mercy. In fact, as I say that, this book that I mentioned is actually about marriage, but this application goes, goes way beyond that. I'm going to read a quote, and I want you to listen to it, about how the, the author makes that point that it goes well beyond it. And he does that as he speaks about love and, and ultimately mercy in general. And to give some context to this quote, what he's talking about is, is, is that how within marriage you have love that has to, to be along, live alongside truth, right? You know, if, if, you, if you don't have love and truth, then, then it doesn't work. And, and that love, you know, love that doesn't address challenges doesn't work, especially in view of this idea that we have about love as sort of this mushy romantic feeling, right? So listen to what he says. He says, love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms us but it keeps us in denial about our flaws. But truth without love is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness about who we are, and yet also radical, unconditional commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. The conviction and repentance moves us to cling and rest in God's mercy and grace. And as I say that, hopefully you heard the shift. Seamlessly, this, this quote went from the mercy that we should show to the mercy that we receive. And Timothy Keller, that's the author of that quote, he makes the, that great point about truth and love. He makes that point that truth and love go hand in hand, but in a different way of saying it, he says, but mercy is what God's mercy is to us ultimately, is that he knows the truth about us, but he still loves us. That's why we're marked by mercy as Christians, is because 
He has been merciful to us. God has known just how sinful you are. God has known how sinful you are even more than you know how sinful you are. He has known that that debt of 200,000 years worth of labor that you could never repay. And yet he's forgiven that debt. That debt has been nailed to that cross of Jesus in 30 AD in Jerusalem, buried in that tomb of Jesus. The, The burning of the note of your debt has been made public on the day of his resurrection. And to tie it back to what we call the, those proper marks of the church, that's what those marks mean. Those marks of the, the pure, preaching of the pure gospel, the, the right administration of the sacrament, the giving of the, the Lord's Supper and baptism. In those, God, without equivocation, has given His mercy to you. Promised you that this is the case for you. How can you not be merciful in view of that? How can you forgive whatever has happened to you, no matter the hurt? And don't get me wrong, there is real hurt. And my wife and I were talking about that this week to our kids. We were saying that if if someone did something to our children, then it would be extremely hard for us to forgive that person. But even still, there is that call to mercy. How? Because as hurtful as that is to me, God has forgiven me far beyond that. You know, it might not seem like it to my my puny, self-absorbed understanding, my, my sinful self that wants to wallow in all the bad that's happened to me, but it's true. My debt to God far, far surpasses even the worst sin that could possibly be committed against me. And yet God has shown me mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive Mercy, and as I say all of that, I think it's worth concluding with one thought to tie it all together. And that's that, that, has, that verse in particular has to be understood properly. The merciful don't earn that blessing by being shown, a blessing of being shown mercy by virtue of their mercy. The blessing of mercy always comes from God first. It originates from Him to us in Christ. That's the only way that we can show that mercy. On the flip side, our lack of mercy rejects and denies that, but it always comes from Him first. And as we receive that mercy, that's how we are holy. That's how we are saints. Always by the holiness that He gives to us in His grace. But in that we are truly holy in that we are truly saints with all those who have gone before us in the faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in that faith that sanctifies you and makes you His saint eternally through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please rise as we continue with prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Almighty God, by your marks of the church, by your gospel, by baptism, by the Lord's Supper, you have given us your mercy and you have made us your holy saints. We thank you that by that work of your Holy Spirit we are sanctified sanctified in the blood of your Son, Jesus, who has redeemed us, and in all that, in your love for us, in your compassion, and in your mercy. We give thanks for all of your goodness, O Lord, and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for those marks of the Church, the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service in that mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Save us, O Lord, and defend your whole church purchased with the blood of Christ. 
Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in that love and in all good works, and establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, Hear send the light of your truth into all the earth, O Lord, raising up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy. Hear o Lord, preserve our nation in justice and honor that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and pay favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this state, and to all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Take from us all hatred and prejudice, O Lord, giving to us a spirit of love and ordering our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations and that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased amongst all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Sanctify our homes with your presence, O Lord, and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service. that They may show you praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Let your blessing remain upon us, O Lord, in the seed time and in harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and the rest, and the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those who work, whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all of those who have put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Give also to us thankful hearts for your daily bread, and be with all of those celebrating especially those gifts of daily bread in our day, birthdays, anniversaries, and other joyous occasions, those whom we list in the bulletin, Jackson, Trebuzio, Liz Freiberger, Lisa Malarkey, Paul Sulak, and Don and Gail Steele. Lord, in your mercy. Hear By your word and Holy Spirit, O Lord, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially all of those listed in our bulletin, Leslie, Gary, Peggy, CJ, Ann, Jennifer, Isaac, Blake, John, Tim, Richard, Phyllis, Christine, Jim, Cassie, the Horwath family, Brian, Kevin, the Cooey family, Mary Jane, Eleanor, Kulaga, and family, Jack, Steve, Charlene, Gail, Sonny, Tyler, Bruce, Rod, Deborah, Lisa, Kathy, Dorothy, Joyce, and Bob, Carol Ann, Levi, Lena, Leah, Jurgen, the Reilly family, Sharon, Sharon, Herb, Judy, and Kurt, Don and Gail, Noah, Chris, Mike, Ellie, Addison, and Nancy. Be with those, O Lord, who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy upon those to whom death draws near, and bring consolation to those in sorrow, granting to all the measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy. We remember with thanksgiving, O Lord, those who have loved and served you in your church on earth, and who now rest from their labors. On this day especially, we remember those who you, whom you have called to yourself in the past year, Violet Beck, Patricia Crass, and John Hebner. Keep us in fellowship with them and all your saints, and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, O Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with the uh, preparation for the sacrament of the altar. Please rise as we continue with the service of the sacrament found beginning on page 10 of the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And with Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with the angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Samuel, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. Now this is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Strengthen and preserve you in body and soul. In the one true saving faith to life everlasting, depart in peace. We'll continue with the New Dominus found on page 12 of the bulletin. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Spirit. Bless we the Lord. Be the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 676, Behold a Host Arrayed in White. You can find it on page 13 of the bulletin.
Let every rejoice.